Okay, good evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the application process and how we manage it at QE. So, the first thing to know is that students apply online. So, if you apply to university when I did, it was a paper system. Students could apply, or you could apply to multiple universities and you had to write out copious applications on paper with Tipex to cover up all of your mistakes. Nowadays, they apply online, they apply to up to five universities and um, they send one application and it goes off to the universities they've chosen. The other universities can't see who else they've applied to. There's no ranking system. At this stage, the universities don't have to decide who's a favourite or anything like that. They just apply to the universities of their choice. Obviously, though, with one application, it's important that the personal statement they write matches the applications for the five they're applying to. Okay. So, some terminology. I'm very conscious in the audience there's going to be some people who've got older brothers and sisters that have been to university and know lots about it. There's going to be people who work at universities in the audience and are lecturers. But really, for some of our students, this is the first time they've considered university and they, they'll be met with a whole load of terminology that they're not sure about. Um, the first word they need to know is that they're going to apply to be an undergraduate. They don't have a degree already. So the first thing when they're doing university searches will be to look at the undergraduate section. Then there are different types of degree, BSCs, which are science degrees, BAs, arts degrees, and by that it means arts in the broadest sense, so written subjects like English, history would be an arts degree. Um, BNG, engineering degrees, and an LLB is a law degree. Okay. So if a student comes across some terminology they're not sure about, a member of staff in school will be able to help them, probably their teacher, or they can email the curriculum team, or they can ask an appointment at any time. Okay. Um, then there's these, this very complicated terminology called foundation. And unfortunately, the universities have chosen to use foundation to mean lots of different things. So foundation years are years that are designed to help a student bridge something from their A-levels to going to university. So it might be that a student doesn't have the right qualifications. Um, and they need to do something different to build up a deficit in their A-level. So they might have not have done maths A-level and now want to do engineering and a foundation year would allow them to do that. Quite often they have lower entry requirements but it does mean you're doing an extra year of university at those costs. Um, foundation degrees are degrees that are designed to sometimes be work done alongside uh, working so they can be done part-time. Again, they tend to have lower entry requirements and they're usually more vocational in their uh, nature. So they're usually getting somebody ready to work in a certain sector. Um, foundation degrees last for two years and can be topped up to be full degrees. They're usually offered at places like Newcastle College might do foundation degrees and then you might get an awarding full degree from Northumbria if you go on to do a full degree subject. And then just to make it even more complicated, there's something called a foundation course. A foundation course, for us, the main one that students apply for is Art Foundation and that's where you go to somewhere like Newcastle College and do a level three course in art. So it's the same level as A-level or your BTEC level three that you're doing now, but you would go on to do a course that broadens you out before you specialise and decide you want to do an art degree at university. It doesn't, it, it doesn't attract the same tuition fees as um, a degree would, so it's about £3,000, but it's free if you're 18 when you start your course. So you can go to Newcastle College, do a foundation year to broaden your art, and then you would go on and decide, I want to do a degree in art, and you'd have more of a portfolio to apply with. Or you would say, actually, I've done a lovely year of art, and now I'm going to go and get a job, or I'm going to go to university and do geography. Um, it's up to you. But there's no cost if you started at 18. Okay. Um, the next thing that students might hit when they're doing their research into university is the length of degree. So some degrees are three years, some are four years. Usually they're four years if they have another element built into it. That might be a year working in industry, and that's known sometimes as a sandwich course, where sandwiched in the middle is a placement at university. Sometimes it might be that they're studying abroad um, and they're doing a language degree, for example, and they're going to go and spend a year working in France or a year studying at a French university. And another term students come across is master's degrees. Usually they are, in England, they are degrees that you do after you've done your undergraduate degree, you go on and do a higher level of qualification. They don't need to worry too much about that now, other than to say some universities 
will try and attract students onto master's degrees at the same time as they sign up for their undergraduate. So it's sort of an integrated um, process where you can apply for a four year course. Students need to do their own research on to the advantages and disadvantages of signing up for that and by listening to university talks, hopefully that will help them navigate their way through that. The only other thing to say about masters is um, Scottish universities make it slightly more complicated in that they use the term masters sometimes to talk to all about ordinary degrees. So some universities in Scotland use the term masters when they actually mean the same as a BA or a BSc in England. Um, the Scottish system it refers to the way that Scotland organises its university experience. So students there embark on four year courses as standard. The first year is like a broad um, opportunity to explore more than one subject. So usually you can study three subjects and then you get a choice of how much you want to narrow down and specialise after that first year. Um, so students need to do their research about the benefit, the pros and cons of the Scottish system for them. Some English uh, universities are starting to operate a little bit like the Scottish system in a three year degree. So they're allowing some element of exploration in year one before you specialise in years two and three. So it's worth students just finding out a bit more about if they're uncertain of the degree they want to study, do they want to do an extra year and use the Scottish system to find out about it. Core and elective units are something else the students are going to need to understand. So at A level, all of the modules are chosen by the teacher and you have no choice over what you're going to be examined on. The whole point of a degree is that it is more um, flexible to you and your interests. So it's really, really important that students explore what core elements, what compulsory things will they have to study and what, el what elective or choice elements will they have within their degree and are they the ones that match their interests. Um, so definitely encourage your son or daughter to explore beyond the title of the course, look beyond history to look at the periods of history you can study and whether they can choose the, the periods that particularly interest them. And then the final thing to say is they will come across um, combined degrees. So that's the opportunity to, to some degree or other, have more than one subject in your degree. So a joint degree will actually declare both titles. If you chose to do history and English, you would get a degree that was awarded in the end that states that you've done a degree in history and English. And again, students need to look carefully at how much choice they would have if they did a joint degree. Will they have more core elements, compulsory elements? Are they happy with those elements? What's the workload difference, if there is any? And how do they genuinely want to do an equal amount of both? Or would they be happy to do a major minor type system where you do more of one um, subject than the other? Or would they be happy to do something like uh, Leeds Uni do with the discovery modules, where you're doing one degree, but you're getting to go outside of your discipline and maybe study a foreign language as a, as a module? Okay, entry requirements. So the things that we want to draw your attention to about entry requirements are they're quite complicated. The universities don't always make it very easy to understand. And sometimes you will have to contact them for more clarity. Um, some universities only make an entry requirement or, or an offer to a student on the basis of their grades. So they might say, for example, you need to get A, B, B. And they're interested in your three main grades and they want them to be at, the, at that level. Some universities will say, we're happy for you to get the same number of UCAS points as ABB, but as long as they add up in the end to those UCAS points, then we're happy for that to be made up of ABC, or AAC could be for that student. So UCAS points are more flexible and they allow you to bring sometimes all the qualifications in. So your son or daughter might have done HSLA, Arts Award or the EPQ, and they might be allowed to use the UCAS points from other qualifications and bring that in. Some students who've changed course have a half qualification in a BTEC. Again, a UCAS points offer might allow them to bring that half qualification in. Um, some universities, most universities, will accept a blend of BTECs and A-levels. So they might be that your son or daughter is doing two A-levels and a BTEC. When you go onto the university websites, there are very, very few that will tell you that's a possibility. It will tell you how many grades you have to have at A level, and it will tell you that you need three distinctions for BTEC, but it won't tell you that if you have one BTEC, you need to have a distinction in that, and then an A and a B in your remaining two A levels. 
you need to do your research. If they don't make it explicit on the website, you can email the admissions team at the university is always on their website, the email address of admissions, and you can just clarify that they do accept it. So please don't assume that if it's not on the website, they don't accept it. It's just that they don't go into that level of detail with their entry requirements. Some universities ask you to have subject specific requirements. So that's where they're saying, we want you to have A, A, B for this course, but actually the, one of the A's has to be in chemistry. And so that's where the students have really got to start looking at the small print to make sure they don't end up with an automatic rejection because they haven't realised there's an element of something in the entry requirements that they haven't investigated sufficiently. And then um, EPQs are quite uh, used differently by different universities. Some universities just say, we welcome them, we love the fact you've done your EPQ, if you can bring it into your personal statement, we'll read it and we'll be really interested. Some people might use it if they interview you to talk to you about an interview. Others, though, say, no, we really value an EPQ to the point where we'll make you a lower offer if you've done well in your EPQ. And so then they'll give you on the, on the uh, website, it will say, we will knock a grade off if you've achieved an A or a B in your EPQ. So um, have a look out for that. And then GCSEs, um, sometimes universities, most universities say, we want you to have five GCSEs, including your maths and English at grade four. That's usually what they say. Some universities for some courses, though, say, actually, we want you to have a six in your, one, your sciences, or we want you to have a six in English, or we want you to have a six in maths. It's usually those three subjects that crop up as the ones that they have a specific requirement for. So universities, again, students need to research each individual university. We can't give generic advice. Michelle and I know quite a lot about universities, but we don't know every university's entry requirement for every course. And to be honest, even if we did, it changes every year. So students have to look at it really, really carefully and know what they're applying for so they don't get caught out. Okay, and that's just an example of what, if you went onto a website for Sheffield University to study psychology, of what you'd be faced with as a student. So it is quite difficult to navigate. So on there you can see standard offer is um, what they're asking students for. So standard offer for them is AAB. Um, you can then see that you need to have, uh, if you've got an EPQ, they will make you a lower offer of ABB. You can then see that if you're doing BTEC, they want three distinctions. So it's probably safe to say for that course that if you rang or contacted them, emailed them, you'd probably find it was two A's and a distinction in reality for that course. And then you can also see um, that they want a, a B in maths or a six in maths and that they're asking for specific science subjects and they actually go on to list what they mean by science. So for that particular course, if you've studied psychology A level, they will accept that as your science. Um, but each university varies and the students have to go down to this level of detail and if they're not sure they need to email the admissions team to find out and answer their questions. Okay so the other things to talk about with entry requirements are um, widening participation so this is about universities attracting students from different backgrounds into university and recognizing that not everyone's got level playing fields for, for accessing courses so some universities will require you to have signed up to a year 12 programme. So Durham University, um, which we've advertised on the bulletin, for example, has a programme, you sign up in year 12. The idea is they support you through year 12 on a journey that gets you ready for applying to university. And in doing so, it then makes you eligible to apply for a slightly lower offer. Newcastle Uni, conversely, don't ask you to engage with them in year 12 but ask you at the point you're applying to university in year 13 to say that you wish to be part of their widening participation scheme and they will then take you on a journey during year 13 and you'll do some summer school work with them after your A-levels, getting you ready for that transition to university. That's what it's all about. To do widening participation, you have to meet certain criteria. And again, that varies by university. Quite often it's to do with postcode and how many people in your area have gone to university, parental income, free school meals, um, some, sometimes, but less than it used to be, it can be factors that have affected your education, but, but less than it, than it used to be. So again, students have to do their research quite carefully. They have to look at the bulletin and, and see what we're advertising. They probably should have already acted if they're writing participation on some of the schemes we've advertised already during year 12. They should be looking ahead and saying, are there any that I can um, use in year 13? And they need to know the criteria that they are eligible for and who is valuing that as a criteria to take part in the schemes. 
Okay, the other thing about what, uh, entry requirements is some courses actually have specify that you have to have done work experience in order to be eligible to apply for their course. So an example of that would be um, a course like radiography where they actually specify that you not, must have done a full day in a radiography department. So it isn't enough to have worked in a hospital sector setting, you have to have actually worked in a radiography department for 24 or 12 hours or whatever it is. Um, if you want to be a vet, then there's actually quite an extensive separate form that students fill out about their work experience to show that they've got that breadth of experience. Now, obviously, we've been in a pandemic uh, situation for 12 months now, so we're expecting the universities to change some of their requirements, the mandatory stuff that they have on work experience. But even if they do do that, they will be expecting students to be knowledgeable in other ways about the course and the um, job or career that they're hoping to go and work in. So students need to, to one, explore how the universities are changing their requirements, what are, know what the minimum requirements are, and then work out a plan to do that either virtually or physically so that they can, that it doesn't become a barrier. It also, obviously, if things do improve and we can get students out into the community, it's really good for them to do work experience and be informed and know what they're applying for. It will help their application, it will help them feel confident that they're doing the right thing, it'll help, it'll come over in their personal statement that they know what they're applying for and they're going to be suited to it and it's just a really good thing to do. So obviously virtual isn't quite as good but it's better than not understanding the job role at all and there's loads on YouTube about work experience, day in the life of things that students can explore. And then finally admissions test on entry requirement. Admissions tests are set by the university, again it varies by courses, so there's no blanket statement that we can give you that says for these courses, you, you literally have to go down to uni and course level to know whether there's an admissions test and that changes year on year. Uh, students are responsible for signing up for their admissions tests, some of them are done inside school and administered by the exams office at school, but they don't know the students need to have that test, the students need to go and register with them and uh, make sure that they've done everything they need to do in a good time to be ready for that test. Some are done outside of school at, at driving centres and places like that. And so again, the student needs to do the research and apply to have that test done. And obviously, the sooner they know about those tests, the more they can be preparing for whatever it is that the test is going to ask them to do. Quite often, you can prepare by practising timing and type of question, things like that. Okay. Okay. How to research university. So what, what we would really say is that you, by the end of your uh, journey through navigating what you're going to apply for, which university you're going to apply to, you need to become the expert. By the time somebody sits down with you to review your application, you should be able to tell them everything there is to know about why you've chosen those courses, how you know you meet the entry requirements for it, how you know you've satisfied them in your personal statement, that you've done all the right things that they're looking for to prove that you're right for it. And just be certain that you're applying for the right course for you. My strongest advice as somebody who's been through this process with one child already is to, to start broader and then narrow down. So even if a student feels like they definitely know what they want to be or what they want to study, I would say that's fine. If you spend some time online looking at a particular uni for a particular course, mm. encourage the students to start looking at two or three other courses that that university offers as well by way of comparison and probably it will help them just say no I much prefer what I've just heard about that course but it may not it may just sow some seeds of actually I didn't even know that was there so if there's new courses new things that they haven't looked at before definitely get them to broaden out before they narrow down. Taster sessions have become much bigger at, um, because of the pandemic so they are a really positive thing that's happened uh, because of virtual um, virtual university interactions with students. So taster sessions allow you to know much more about the subject and sometimes when you go on an open day it's all about looking at the buildings and the facilities and you get moved around from one room to another and you're learning all the time. You, you definitely pick things up from open days so definitely if you get the chance to go to a physical open day and experience uni do it because it does excite the students. It's lovely to go and see the accommodation. It starts to make them think, why am I doing these A-levels? It's going to, it's doing it because I want to go on to do that new exciting thing in that new exciting city. But taster sessions allow you to reflect more on what will I be studying and will I be interested in it? And that's 
what students have the benefit of more this year at, at their leisure in their own comfort of their own room they can spend an hour or half an hour listening to somebody do a sample lecture or talk about the content of a course in much more detail than I think they could before the pandemic so that's a definite positive and should definitely be encouraged um, the main way to start if, you, if your son or daughter is wondering how to find a way into um, research in universities then university websites are a brilliant resource and they are the best place to go for detail. UCAS has a course search in there, you put in a word and it brings up everybody that offers anything slightly related to that. So to broaden out first, UCAS is quite a good uh, starting point. And then obviously we use we have the SICFUN Bulletin. We, SICFUN Bulletin only works, it doesn't work by osmosis, it only works if students actually open it up and read it. There's lots in there. Some weeks there'll be some nothing in there, they'll be looking and thinking it's all about Oxford or it's all about friendships. But we try and make it varied. Anything that anyone brings to our attention we put on there. We can't represent every uni and everything that's going on, so students can't rely on the bulletin solely. They do need to do their own research, start targeting uni, signing up for information, regularly checking to see what taster days and open days they're doing. But the bulletin is there as another strand to just let us share anything that we're aware of with you as, a, as an opportunity. And then we've got um, a session that we'll be running for the students as part of our progression afternoons where we'll be talking them through some of the ways they can compare universities and courses to make sure that they're ending up with decisions that work for them and that the universities meet their needs. Okay, so just a, a tiny bit now on timing, so how it kind of works at QE. So, um, students are going to be asked after this session, after this set of sessions this evening, to complete a form where they can choose which which um, afternoon sessions they attend. Um, it's really important on that form that they actually tell us as well whether they need a space reserving in school school spaces at a premium, particularly for computers. So we're hoping most students, by doing the sessions virtually, will be able to go home with their Wi-Fi, log on in, in perfect isolation and concentrate on some IOG for four afternoons. Um, if they can't get home in the time though, we're more than happy for them to come into um, school, stay in school and we'll find a computer room for them to work in. Um, in May, so the students are doing their April formal exams and then after they've been marked and moderated and the talked about the students in their subjects, then the teachers will publish a sunshine grade. A sunshine grade is a UCAS grade. It's a grade with a good win, the best grade we think the student could possibly get um, if, with all things going well for them on the exam day. It's different to a predicted grade because it has that element of um, optimism in it. Sometimes people's UCAS grade and Sunshine grade will be the same thing. The students only just made it into a grade boundary, you know, we think they're just making it as a prediction into a B then the sunshine might actually be that it's a high B on a good day. So it doesn't necessarily mean the student's going to get two different grades from us. It's just the teacher trying to build in that element of on a good day, how would the student perform? So those come out on the 14th of May. And that gives students quite a good indication of where to pitch themselves when they're looking at universities. Um, and we tend to say that students should pitch one, maybe a both are slightly optimistic if they want to, they don't have to, but they can go for a slightly more aspirational one. The majority should be around their um, UCAS grades and it's safer to have one that's a, a point of difference, a safety net. And that might be a safety net because it's UCAS points as opposed to grades, or it might be that it doesn't require a certain grade in a certain subject, or it might be that it's just a lower a lower offer altogether. It's, it's three C's instead of two B's and a C. Um, okay, so the big thing to say as well about QE is we don't do everything, we don't make everyone do the same thing, it's not a production line of getting students straight from year 13 to university. So we tend to have it as a student-led um, process. So students tell us when they've reached a point where they're happy that they know what they're applying for. They're not writing a generic application to university about all the wonderful things they do outside of school. They're writing a specific application for a specific course. So it's really important that they're ready to do, you know, they know they're ready to do that. So when they feel they know where what they want to apply for, not necessarily where at that stage, but what course they want to apply for, they can then get in touch with the curriculum team and say, please, can I be assigned a referee? And that person will help them 
formulate their ideas, start to work on their behind the scenes on their reference for them and just get them ready for that university journey. But we only do that triggered by the student telling us that they're ready to do it. Um, the students are then asked to draft a personal statement um, and a lot of that they can do themselves and again then the referee will work with them on the ordering and what the most important elements and talk to them if, there's, if they're lacking in a certain area and how to draw that out. Um, okay and then okay yeah and then a little bit further down the line sort of towards September time we give final predictor grades out so the UCAS Sunshine sometimes have a little bit of movement in them if students want to work over the summer to try and improve their grades. They don't always change, it's at department level, they're the best, they're the experts in how that student's performing in their subject. But there is quite a lot of work goes on over the summer. Teachers are writing paragraphs about the student in their subject that form the basis of the reference that the referee will write for them. So that's all happening. And then the students can be ready to send their forms. The first students to send their forms are the ones with an early application date of the 15th of October. So that's vets, medics, dentists, and those students applying to Oxford or Cambridge. But actually there's nothing to stop. If a student was ready, we've had other students going in October who are applying for nursing or history. It's just as the student's ready, we will process their application form. Um, and then we follow up for some courses, there is an interview with definitely going to happen. Um, so where we know those courses are going to require it, such as medicine, we will start working on students on interviews. Others we don't know they're going to interview, it might be an engineering course that interviews and students can request a practice interview and we will put an appeal out to parent, the parent body to say, do you work in the sector? Could you put somebody through their paces just so that they're talking to someone they're not familiar with to help them learn to talk to a stranger in those formal situations? Um, okay, my, I think this is my last slide. Um, so deferring in gap years. So the next thing to just put students' minds at rest is if they do decide they're ready to apply to university and they embark with us and they get referee and they're going along and they change their mind at any point in the process, no one's going to make them go to university. They can say, can I just put my application on file and I'll come back to it when I feel more confident about it. And it can be quite good while you're in school and you've got it all going on around you and all your friends are applying to just start the process. So because it, it, if nothing else, it starts to formulate in your mind, what would I need to do to make my application stronger? And if students don't start the application process early, the danger is they put it all off, they bury their heads in the sand a little bit and they're not collecting the evidence they need to either confirm that they're doing the right thing or prove to someone else that they're applying for the right course. Students can also decide to apply this year, so in, in year 13 they can apply for university but they can tell the university at the point of application that they want to defer for a year, that they want to um, apply for the following September start. And universities, sometimes for very competitive courses, can be a bit nervous about giving away places, too many places um, for the year ahead. But I think that's for the students to ask at open days, to, to talk to the admissions tutors, to find out their view on deferring and whether they welcome deferred applications. Another way students can do it is they can go through the application process normal as if they're going to go for the following September to university and then once they've got their offers back they can approach the university to see how they would feel if they deferred their place and that way they can evaluate would I rather go to that university where I've got an offer for this September or am I really desperate to have my gap year and if they don't offer them a deferred place then I'll just reapply the following year and uh, take my chances. The, the kind of the student knows where they stand in that situation. And finally, it's to say if your son or daughter definitely isn't ready to apply this year, they haven't got a clue what they want to do, it's stressing them out even thinking about it, then we're totally supportive of that and we will be here for them um, the following autumn. So we'll actually, that's not true, it'll be from the summer after they finish the A levels, we'll start offering for them to re-engage with this same process in a year's time, encourage them to do the open days and, and go visit. The only thing I would say about that is the open days tend to be on when they're doing their A-levels. So if they can do some research this year, it really is worth trying to go to some universities in year 12 when it's designed to happen. And we will still support them with referees, with advice and guidance. The earlier they get involved in the cycle, the more support they get. 
um, and we have students coming back to us one year, two years, the most I've ever had is five years out saying will you help me apply to university. So it's, they haven't got to do it this year and we'll work with students on the benefits of gap years and how to make their gap year as productive as possible as well because they can be a really, really good thing to help students just mature, be more ready for university, have a job, have some life experience before they leave home and, and go and live somewhere else. Okay, so just a reminder, um, the sixth form bulletin is there as a resource for you and your son and daughter. We're going to have a finance section on it. Um, it's there all the time at the minute, but we're going to leave on some links to student finance so that you can explore a bit more about that area and understand how it works. And we'll be running a session on budgeting and finance for the students as part of their progression afternoons. Okay, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>